The Subcommittee on Oversight will come to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate y'all's patience. Uh, every now and then we have votes that come in to play that uh, interferes with our schedule, and we appreciate everybody's uh, patience. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and the truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. The title of today's hearing is Espionage Threats at Federal Laboratories, Balancing Scientific Cooperation While Protecting Critical Information. I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to our witnesses and to thank you all for joining us here today, and we're looking forward to your testimony. This hearing focuses on the intersection of two very important issues. One, ensuring that the United States remains the world's leader in scientific research and technological innovation, and protecting our national security, on the other hand. Both are extremely important. Finding the appropriate balance between scientific openness and security concerns is not new. But it is critical that we have this type of public discussion regularly so as to ma maintain open lines of communication and, if necessary, recalibrate our strategies to respond to new threats. Science is a global endeavor. International cooperation on science and technology and the open exchange of ideas has led to countless significant breakthroughs that have benefited all of mankind. Here in the United States, visiting foreign scientists and scholars spark innovation and entrepreneurship. They make critical contributions to our economy and they learn firsthand about American culture and values. But we cannot afford to close our eyes to the reality that there are nefarious actors, scheming insiders, business rivals, criminals, even terrorists in foreign intelligence services who exploit a free and open society to steal the results of American ingenuity and innovation. Russia and China have regularly topped the intelligence and law enforcement communities list of the most aggressive and persistent thieves of our scientific and technological information that's very sensitive. Russia views the United States as a strategic competitor and its intelligence services are very capable and just as prolific as ever. And China continues efforts to gain access to advanced technology to fuel its military modernization program, according to the Pentagon's latest report on the capabilities of the Chinese military. The report says China operates a large, well-organized network of companies and re research institutes with both military and civilian R&D functions that enable the Chinese military to, access, to assess and to assess sensitive and dual-use technologies are knowledgeable experts under the guise of legitimate civilian R&D. This raises the question, are American taxpayers' dollars subsidizing the modernization of China's military? Just last week, Chinese media reported that their military is ready to test fly an armed stealth drone, which looks remarkably like some American stealth aircraft. In addition to foreign intelligence services, terrorists could clandestinely acquire the advanced technological information or materials needed to build a nuclear, biological, chemical, or radiological weapon. What if the Boston bombers had used their university ties to acquire radiological material to turn their bombs into dirty bombs? Our goal today is to gain a better understanding of how federal laboratories and their partners in the broader academic and scientific communities balance international scientific cooperation with the need to protect sensitive information. I don't have any prescriptions to put before you. As a doctor, I wish I did. But look instead to our witnesses to identify best security practices and sensible federal policies that don't allow the pendulum to swing too far in either direction. Thank you. Now I recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Maffei, for an opening statement. My friend, you're recognized for five minutes. I want to thank uh, the chairman of the committee, and I want to thank particularly the witnesses uh, and uh, audience today for your patience. 
um, given these uh, the, the voting schedule and um, the logistics of getting back here. I want to associate myself with the comments of uh, the distinguished chairman from Georgia. Um, and I would only add that the challenge at our national labs and our scientific facilities is controlling access to information and innovations that are truly highly sensitive without obstructing the positive interaction that occurs between scientists. So as we see on a routine basis, other nations and foreign corporations are regularly are attempting to steal, siphon or subtly acquire U.S. government secrets or other kinds of proprietary data that has highly technical and scientific value for the economy or national security. So identifying specific espionage threats, developing safeguards against them, and warning American scientists about them is certainly an important task. But it is a task that has to be balanced against the costs of overreacting and inhibiting the advance of scientific understanding and positive international cooperation. So this hearing will help eliminate those trade-offs, and I'm very grateful to the chairman uh, for calling it. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how to strike the right balance between these both very necessary goods. And I hope that our witnesses can offer a key and, if possible, specific recommendations that could be followed um, by us in Congress and the federal government as a whole, as well as inform actions by our universities, private corporations, and laboratories. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Maffei. We have these huge problems with cyber attacks upon business and national labs, and cybersecurity should be at the forefront of what all of us here in Congress focus upon because we have a tremendous uh, potential of economic espionage and scientific espionage. And thank you so much for your opening remarks. If there are any other members who wish to submit, additional opening statements. Your statements will be added to the record at this point. Now at this time I'd like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Charles Vest, President of the National Academy of Engineering and President Emeritus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Our second witness is Dr. Larry Wartzel, Commissioner of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Dr. Wurzel is a former Army counterintelligence special agent. Thank you for your service in the Army, sir. I'm a Marine, and I appreciate your service. If you're a former Marine, too? Hoorah. <laughs> Our third witness is Ms. Michelle Van Cleve, senior fellow at the Homeland Security Policy Institute at the George Washington University. Ms. Van Cleve was also the first national counterintelligence executive and has previously served as counsel on this committee. Welcome back. We're glad to have you. Welcome, Ms. Van Cleve. Our final witness is Mr. David Major, founder and president of the Center for Counterintelligence and Security Studies. Mr. Major is a veteran FBI special agent and experienced counterintelligence educator. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. If you could, please try to restrain yourselves. I know this is a big topic, but if you can, please keep it within the five minutes. I'm not going to, uh, to gavel you down if you go over, but if you could, please limit it to five minutes. And after which, the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. Your written testimony will be included in the record of the hearing. Now, it is the practice of this subcommittee on oversight to receive testimony under oath. If you all would all please stand. I should ask you, do any of you have an objection to taking an oath? Okay. Uh, let the record reflect that all of the witnesses indicated they have no objection to taking the oath. Now, if you would raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses participating have taken the oath. Now, recognize our first witness, Dr. Vest, for five minutes. Yawn, sir. Openness of research and education accelerates discovery, contributes to worldwide advancement of knowledge and technology, and enhances American leadership, economy, diversity, and values. I also understand the importance of security. I served on the Independent Intelligence and Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission appointed by President George W. Bush, and I'm a trustee of Incutel. Here are three things I believe in. The, le the leaky bucket theorem. 
it is far more important to keep filling our bucket of science and technology than it is to obsessively plug every little leak. Second, high fences around the small areas of scientific results and technology that truly must be denied to others through classification. And finally, competing and cooperating with other nations and institutions. <clears throat> Export control and visa policy remained somewhat rooted in the Cold War when we had a single enemy. Our dominant security asset was technology superiority. The Soviet Union's was a huge military. Secrets were more easily maintained and military technologies were mostly separate from consumer products. That ended in 1989. Today we face diffuse threats like terrorism. We no longer singularly dominate the world's science and technology. We are subject to the instant and open communication of the Internet and the World Wide Web. Our military and intelligence agencies are very dependent on commercial products, and our companies have global supply chains, open innovation, manufacturing facilities, customer suppliers, and research laboratories all over the world. In 1982, Executive Order 12356 broadened the government's authority to classify defense-relevant information, but stated basic research information not clearly related to national security may not be classified. However, the government soon forced last-minute withdrawal of 150 technical conference papers on the subject of cryptography. President Ronald Reagan responded to the resulting vigorous debate by issuing National Security Decision Directive 189 that stated it is the policy of this administration that to the maximum extent possible, the products of fundamental research remain unrestricted. The horrific 9-11 attacks raised new questions about our openness. Globalization of modern industries complicated these questions. Visas denied to many foreign students, visitors, and conference participants in the U.S. reflected legitimate concerns, overreaction, bureaucratic foibles, risk aversion, antiquated systems, good intentions, bad policies, heart-rending personal experiences, and finally, slow but steady improvement. My views on scientific, techno technological, and educational openness are based on five considerations. America's traditional values and strengths, the nature of basic science and technology, U.S. science and engineering workforce, the value of a well-educated world, and national security writ large. America's economic and military strength and leadership are made possible by our unique combination of diversity, market economy, investment in research and advanced education, and diversity. There's no longer a singular threat like the Soviet Union or an economically surging Japan. And our world is integrated by digital communication and expanding talent base and new markets everywhere. So we must compete and cooperate. Here's a specific example. In 2011, the U.S. and Chinese Academies of Engineering held a joint meeting of experts to discuss the future of global navigational satellite systems. We discussed applications to consumer products, transportation, agriculture, and science. It was noted that the codes enabling civilians to use the U.S. GPS signals are openly published, whereas the codes for the new Chinese system called COMPASS are closed and unavailable. If both systems could be used, accuracy coverage, reliability, and safety would be improved for all. The CEO of one of our largest U.S. GPS companies explained that in our country, the government launches and maintains the satellites and provides open codes for their use. Entrepreneurs then bring useful applications to market. Soon after this meeting, the Chinese made the codes for Compass openly available. Perhaps we contributed to this decision by cooperating as well as competing. In summary, openness is very important to the U.S. in the 21st century, but our policies have a long and continuing history of sometimes getting unnecessarily in the way. When this occurs, there are three simple guidelines my colleagues and I followed at MIT. One, obey the law. Two, reject grants or contracts incompatible with institutional values. Three, analyze and give voice to needed reforms in federal policy or its implementation. Finally, I commend to you our 2009 National Academies reports titled Beyond Fortress America, National Security Controls on Science and Technology in a Globalized World that was authored by a highly experienced committee co-chaired by retired General Brent Scowcroft 
and Stanford University President John Hennessy. Mr. Chairman, I would be pleased to respond to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Best. I appreciate your testimony. Now I'll go to my fellow Marine. We can talk about why you left the best service to go to the Army <laughs> later on offline, but uh, now, Dr. Watson, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Maffei, members of uh, the committee, thanks for the opportunity to uh, appear before you today. China is uh, putting in somewhere in the area of $1.5 trillion in its uh, 2006 medium to long term plan for the development of science and technology. And it, the expenditure will go from 1.7 percent of GDP to about 2.5 percent of GDP by 2020. That's still less than we spent. Uh, but for the purpose of this hearing, look, it, it really doesn't matter what they're spending. We should be focusing on the fact that China is saving an incalculable amount of time, money, and research effort through espionage and intellectual property theft. Uh, and that science and technology cooperation programs certainly are vital to China and help foster better cooperation between China and the United States. But, but there remains a, a substantial espionage threat posed by Chinese nationals that are working at U.S. labs. Uh, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission in its annual reports have reviewed how China acquires foreign technology through t traditional espionage and through cyber espionage, and we've recommended that Congress provide additional funding uh, and emphasis on export control enforcement and counterintelligence efforts to detect and prevent espionage. And I have to say there's there's sort of a natural tension between maintaining scientific openness and pre preventing espionage. Uh, I, 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 Dr. Vest talked about National Security Decision Directive 189, and that was in 1985. But, but in 2010 and 2012, the, the Office of Secretary of Defense and two other reviews really reaffirm that decision, that, that fundamental research, uh, basic and applied research, has to remain open. And, and anything else is probably going to cripple our universities, cripple our companies, and, and cripple graduate education. So, so if there's one place you might focus, it's on this dividing line between fundamental research and applied technology development. I mean, where is that? I mean, it's a little opaque to me. Um, and, and second, you might look at specific new or emerging technologies that require additional protection. Uh, the, the Army uh, argues that uh, developments in biological agent research, robotics, information and cyber systems, nanotechnology, and explosives or energetics should get a little bit more attention. And uh, other services uh, want to look at uh, integrated circuit technology, new materials, and processes. Uh, so, so I think there is room for that. I also think there's a lot of room for better education uh, in the labs and in universities because you have to know what the cover organizations are that these researchers come in under. Uh, some of them, almost all the intelligence collection organizations I've had, uh, had familiarity with in China have cover organizations, and most people don't know them, including a number of new FBI agents. The other thing to think about when you look at China is you really have to consider the political environment in the home country of a particular researcher. I mean, you're dealing with a citizen of an authoritarian state that's ruled by a single party. The Chinese Communist Party runs the country, it runs the police, the intelligence agencies, and the judiciary. They're all members of the Communist Party. And any resident that applies to study overseas or for a visa is essentially potential hostage to party dictates. And that's in a country that has no rule of law. 
People in China that apply for these passports are often interviewed by the security services. Uh, their future employment, where their, where their relatives live, uh, their relatives' employment uh, is subject to a great deal of uh, uh, pressure. So, and there's no right or refusal for citizens of China if a government asks them to gather information. I thank you for the opportunity to make this uh, testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Now, Ms. Van Cleve, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It is, as you say, a pleasure for me to be here because it's uh, like old home week being back in the old committee hearing room for me. You feel um, like you need to sit back up here? <laughs> somewhere. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Go ahead. Um, uh, but uh, what I would like to do is just to take a second to tell you about another job that I had, uh, which was in the last administration as the National Counterintelligence Executive of the United States. I have to say it's the most fascinating job that no one has ever heard of and very relevant to the subject of today's hearing. Um, there were two major currents that really led to its creation. One was in the wake of the Rick Ames espionage case that um, Ames had been spying for then the Soviet Union, later Russia, for uh, nine years deep within CIA. And it was quite a shock to U.S. intelligence to discover that there had been such a damaging and, and horrible penetration in, in, into U.S. intelligence. So there were studies in the wake of that, you know, what did we miss? Why did we miss it? What were the seams that needed to be plugged? And out of that, uh, those studies, came a recommendation in, from President Clinton that there should be created a national counterintelligence executive that would head up all of U.S. counterintelligence. We had not in decades past since the inception of, of our, our current um, in intelligence infrastructure ever had any individual position where all parts of U.S. counterintelligence would come together. So President Clinton in an, an executive order created this position which was later put into law in 2002 um, by, by the Counterintelligence Enhancement Act passed by this body. And the second, the second theme and thread that really, that really fed into that was the observation that in the wake of the uh, end of the Cold War that there were a lot of other actors involved against the United States, their intelligence activities against the U.S., and that it was beyond simply, simply the more traditional targets of espionage of our, of our national security secrets, but broader interests in U.S. science, technology, our economic base, the riches of this country that really were of concern. And we didn't have a way within the U.S. government to bring together policy and strategy to deal with this kind of threat broadly to, to U.S. Ec um, the economy and society. So that was another current that led to the creation of the position of the NCIX, as the job is called. And thirdly, I would observe, and this is from my experience with, with the job, that, that intelligence is an asset, a technique, resources, a set of tools that foreign powers use to advance their interests and disadvantage ours. And there's a question about how we think about those kinds of threats to the United States from the perspective of how we develop national strategy and policy. And that became yet another responsibility of the office of the NCIX to provide these kinds of policy options to the president and his national security team. With that lengthy ex explanation, it brings me to why I think today's hearing is so important and the fact that the oversight subcommittee is taking on this subject. The United States invests more in R&D on an annual basis than all of the G8 combined. We are everybody in the world's number one target for collection because of that. This is where everything is. All the, all the goodies of our R&D capabilities are resident here in the United States and the things that we do. And so, and so we're everyone's number one target with the possible exception of some of our closest allies and in that case, even some of those would, be, would find us their number one target. Um, and they're virtually interest, they're interested in virtually everything in, in, our, in our economy, in our economic activity, including, of course, uh, our science and technology. This is not a new threat, but the point I want, I want to convey to you is that these numbers are growing in terms of actors and reach and costs. 
It is true that during the Cold War we had a unitary threat, and the fact that we had a unitary threat made it easier to deal with that. Today, the multiplicity of threat, the multiplicity of actors, makes it vastly more difficult to deal with. And these numbers have frankly overwhelmed our ability to deal with those kinds of threats given the current apparatus that we have. Mr. Chairman, the report that you mentioned that the Pentagon released on Chinese military activities is significant in many reasons, but one of those reasons is it's the first acknowledgement that the Chinese have a dedicated program to acquire U.S. technology that is sophisticated, highly resourced, tasked, and, and, uh, and very, very active and successful against us, and they're not the only ones. So how do we understand the costs of this? Well, the FBI estimated on the last fiscal year that it's costing es economic espionage costs us about $12 billion a year. But I would say that that substantially underestimates the potential costs, first because there's underreporting. You don't see firms coming forward and saying we've been hit, so it's difficult to estimate all of that. But also because there's a dynamic cost in estimating, dynamic scoring, if you will, in, in, in understanding real economic costs and what's the cost when we lose competitive ideas in our R&D base. And then thirdly, the whole cyber dimension, which is, uh, is, is, a, is a hearing in 12 unto itself about the largest transfer of wealth in history, as the director of NSA has called cyber attacks against us. So when you put all of those things together, we have a, a, a serious problem. And it is growing worse every year, and the reports out of government are worse every year. And so we talk every year about the need to balance so the question back to this committee is, if things continue to go worse, you know, at what point is it genuinely a terribly serious problem for the United States that there is this hemorrhaging of our technology? I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Van Gleeve. And that point is well taken. And we would very much like to hear some prescription from all of you about how we should go forth legislatively to try to make sure that that tension between openness and security is is met. Uh, as a physician, as a medical doctor, uh, and as a scientist, I, I understand the importance of openness of, of research and development, but um, this is a tremendous tension, and thank you, Ms. Van Cleve. And if you all do have some ideas, we'd like for you to present them to us later on, uh, maybe answers to questions for the record. Now, you look like an FBI agent. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Major, you are recognized for five minutes. Please turn on your microphone. Yes, um, I have been studying espionage for 43 years, which makes me one of the oldest people in this room looking at this particular problem. Um, Michelle and I were at the White House together in the Reagan administration trying to put counterintelligence on the policy table. And since that time, I formed this company called CI Center. It's a little red schoolhouse that tries to train people on the significance of counterintelligence. And we've trained over 100,000 people in the intelligence community on espionage and counterespionage. And we take our information and we put it on an empirical basis because what we have created is a thing called Spypedia. And Spypedia is a way we track espionage around the world every day and make it available to members who are a member of our what is a membership web page. And if I will look at the United States, espionage is a big issue in the United States from 1945, the end of Cold War, to today. I can put some numbers on that and explain exactly the size of espionage as we see it today. Don't forget that during the Cold War, the Russians had 531 Americans who were their clandestine agents operating for them during the Cold War. And, and uh, since that time, how many cases have we had? Well, what we do is we track these cases based on these laws, economic espionage and national security laws classified information and the private sector and we use these this criteria to track it and we're right now the big talk is about the insider threat and that's what this hearing is about the fact of the matter is the insider threat has always been with us and will be with us we say how many espionage cases have we had in which has been legal action taken against the people who have acquired the information in the last 68 years the answer is 564 people now, we look at espionage cases, technology transfer, where they take the material itself, and in, uh, technology uh, acquired through in the private sector. And if you notice, last year we had 64 cases, that's the largest we've had. Notice the last 10 years, since 2000, there's an expansion, a growth, exactly as uh, Michelle was talking about, the reality of what we have on this issue. 564 cases, an average of 8.1 over that time period, but not in the last 10 years. Where are they coming from? Now they're coming from the private sector. Over 
over 260 people who have been uh, charged from the private sector and the government section also we see it. How are we doing catching spies? Well, one good news is every one of these cases were a case that were related to national security information in which they were trying to acquire classified information were interdicted by the FBI before the person ever actually passed it. That's the good news. Uh, these two were at the national laboratories they, and they were trying to acquire information for Venezuela. We have and also three cases of FARA Foreign Agent Registration Act. That's the good news. Here's another bad news message. If we look at every case, someone was an agent of a foreign power operating in the United States but hadn't been caught yet. We said, how many agents are out there each year? Well, our average turns about to at least 25 who will eventually get caught. And for 33 years, the average has been above 25. The biggest we had is 53. Compare that to how many we caught, and they we're using catching at the best of the years, 25%. So it continues to be a problem. It continues something we have to invest in. Now, the average spy will last about one to five years, but they can do significant damage during that period. We say what well, countries are conducting uh, espionage against the United States, and it turns out that obviously Russia, the Soviet Union, is the largest, but China is coming up really quickly. Between 1949 and 2000, there were only five Chinese cases. Now there are 100 cases. There have been 95 new cases in the last 13 years, and they are the largest uh, growth area has in Chinese cases that have led to legal action against the individuals. You can see the other countries. But what is interesting here, we've tracked the countries, the dark blue represents represents national security cases, in other words, classified material, and the light blue represents private sector or corporate espionage, and you notice that China is a very large profile in the private sector espionage cases, even though they've attacked classified information. Notice that Iran has never has, they're only using diversion, or there's no national security Iran cases, but they're the largest diverter of material. And if we look at Chinese cases, the 100, you notice what the trend line has been since the year 2000. We also look at that compared to Russia. You can see how many cases that we have seen here in the United States. We talk about foreign entities involved in classified information. This shows you that it's been the Soviet Union and Cuba and China and Iraq and so forth. On economic espionage cases, why target us? We've talked about this. This is a great thing. It comes from Scientific America and shows you between research papers, patents, issues, expenditures, and higher education, the United States is number one. But if you go down to China, number three, and you go way over to the right-hand side, they're not even on the higher education side because they get here to cut their education. And some of them stay and then steal inf information and pass it on to China. Um, if you look at cases of economic espionage, you can see the trend line. The red line is the number of cases. The blue line is the number of people. Because in economic espionage cases, you're normally looking at 1 to 1.8 per case. It's, a, it's more of a conspiracy than it is an individual by themselves. But the company benefiting from uh, economic espionage cases have been China, Taiwan, South Korea, India, Japan. 85% of all these cases come from Asia. That's where the majority of these kinds of cases are coming from. If you look at domestic and foreign cases, you can see China, Iran, Russia. These are the actors in this side of the issue. Why, what are they targeting? I think very revealing that the number one target is information systems. They're targeting our information systems to get the technology to do external targeting of our information. So they do cyber warfare by using our information to then attack us externally. So they internally acquire it and then use that to externally target us. And it's across the board the kinds of information they're targeting. Why target the United States, as I said, information technology, industrial information, uh, military information, and business. It's across the board on what a man United States manufactures. That's who is targeting us during this period. On illegal exports, the exports are obviously increasing, primarily coming from Iran. And if we look at these cases benefiting China, Iran, Russia, Taiwan for, for illegal export cases. So that's what we're finding in Spypedia as we track this. And excuse me for going a minute over on that. I'll answer any questions you have on this material. Boy, that, you could go on with that, that longer. You didn't have to talk that fast. That was a lot of information. I appreciate it, Mr. Major. Um, <clears throat> it's excellent. I thank you all for your testimony. Now, reminding members that the committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. Uh, the chair at this point will open the first round of questions and I recognize myself for five minutes. Dr. Vest, in your testimony, you used the analogy of a leaky bucket and suggested that it would be better to keep filling the bucket rather than to obsess over plugging the holes. But reports from the U.S. intelligence community, the Pentagon, and testimony that we've heard today seem to suggest that at least one of those holes were pretty big and continues to grow. 
if we don't do something about China, we may not have much water left in our bucket. Would it be possible and acceptable within the academic and scientific communities to implement a targeted approach to address the growing threat from Chinese espionage while still generally adhering to the principle of keeping basic fundamental research open and unrestricted? It's obviously a complicated question, and uh, I uh, go back to something that uh, Ms. Van Cleve said, which is they're interested in virtually everything. And uh, I do not think that we can keep virtually everything secret from the Chinese or anyone else. So I would still contend that we should focus on two things. Uh, one is really protecting those things that the uh, national security community believes to be the most important, weapon systems, etc. And secondly, uh, I very much agree with what has been said by uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and others, that we really have to do something about uh, making ourselves more secure against cyber intrusion. Stealing is different than openness of the academic uh, community. Precisely where that line is, I don't know. But given the speed with which science and new technology move forward these days, we simply cannot keep absolutely everything closed and secret, nor do we want to. So I still contend that the leaky bucket approach is correct today, even though the numbers are, are getting larger and the areas of interest are getting larger. We have to focus on the things that are critical and help our laboratories and our universities to remain as, as open as possible so that we transmit our, our values, learn from each other. Every company I know anything about now does research, serves markets, virtually everywhere in the world. I gave in my testimony an example of the new Boeing aircraft that's built in 535 different places. Uh, we can't just keep everything on our shores totally closed up. And I think it's up to the universities, by the way, uh, to do some of their own drawings of lines and simply not do research that they believe uh, needs to be uh, uh, classified or, or thought of in some different way. Well, Dr. Vess, I hope that the bucket still has a bottom to it and it's not just a, a, a sieve or, or but I, I agree with you. Communication between the science and security communities to deal with the questions raised by this hearing is very critical. What are the examples of effective methods for conducting such a dialogue, Dr. Vess? Well, I think that um, after 9-11, there was actually some very productive dialogue back and forth between the universities, the national academies, the security uh, establishment, and some of those things went pretty well. Uh, things such as, uh, uh, as uh, defining the so-called select agents, the biological materials that uh, everybody agreed needed to be uh, uh, restricted uh, in their use on campuses and under secure facilities and so forth. But on the other hand, during that period, we also uh, uh, saw things like technology alert lists that didn't want to let people in the country who had studied fields like landscape architecture. So we got a little bit over the map. I think the dialogue is the important thing because uh, in my uh, uh, relatively modest forays into engagement with the intelligence community. These, as we know from the table, are very intelligent, very thoughtful, very patriotic people, and so are most of us in universities and independent research laboratories. So to me, ongoing dialogue uh, is, is the key to trying to find somewhere where that fuzzy line that Dr. Wurzel referred to is, and then I think universities need to adhere to it. Well, my time has expired, but if you, any of y'all have any suggestions about to uh, create more dialogue between the communities, I'd appreciate it. Now I'll recognize Mr. Maffei for uh, five minutes. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I want to thank again this panel for your testimony. I I've, haven't been on this committee very, very long, but we've had already had a lot of distinguished witnesses, but I think this is probably the most distinguished panel that we've had. Nonetheless, only one of you, Mr. Majors, actually has a degree from Syracuse University. So <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Mr. Major. Uh, but we have a Marine. Well, that's, that's good. That's, they're very, that's very important. But uh, what, what advice would you give uh, scientists, people working at these labs, in order to ward off these, uh, these, these practices? And, and, and I don't know, we don't have a lot of time here, but is there a best practices that could be followed? Does your company ever do that kind of training? And if, if they're not being followed, why not? Or, or how can we get a better, uh, are there simple things that maybe can be done to at least ward off some of these uh, in, uh, intrusions, these espionage efforts? Well, thank you for your question. First of all, it's uh, Syracuse University and biochemistry, and I go orange men. Uh, and I was in the United States Army, I should tell you also, but I'm not a Marine. Um, we, um, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, this idea of education of espionage is not a new problem, but tr some of the hardest targets to trying to targets to educate are academics and uh, people in laboratories. Department of Energy has been struggling with this problem for many, many years, as has anybody who ever deals with universities. When I was a supervisor in Baltimore, I had trouble with the universities up there to, to explain to them the reality of what was happening with some of their students that were coming there, because we know that students represent a particular problem when they come in there. We actually had a, a dean go in and tell the Chinese students, he said, the FBI may come in here to talk to you. If they do, come to me, because you have no obligation in this country to talk to the FBI. Well, I in and I had a discussion with them, and I said, it is my responsibility to worry about this, well, regardless of what you say, Mr. Uh, is the dean there. So this is always a long, long problem. It's an education problem, and you have to uh, do it in a creative way. You have to be very realistic. You have to be pithy. You have to let them know the facts. You can't just go in and say, there is a problem. Now, I will tell you this and follow up to the last discussion, is that if we can sometimes make a mistake, and we said the problem is primarily in classified national security information, but our empirical evidence evidence shows us that across the board the United States is being targeted and some corporations are having them on themselves to create meaningful protection programs that can be worth an awful lot of money. I mean DuPont had a major case where they were trying to steal titanium oxide which is worth billions of dollars. That's white paint. But that's worth a lot of money and yet we have ex espionage cases trying to steal those kinds of information. So you have to really educate people on it. You have to be realistic. You have to invest in it. And this is a problem. It's a problem in a government and it's a problem in corporations. Pro corporations, there's a movement in some corporation to create their own internal counterintelligence cells to do a better job of educating them on this. Probably the single best thing you can do. Then there's a lot of other things you have to do that have to do with cybersecurity and, and the failures that mis mis mistakes people make. When we go through and, uh, and talk in our courses and we do that as, a, as one of the products that this uh, company does is that we try to explain what has happened in the past and where the f it broke down and where it failed and what you can do. And the people are very shocked when they realize that despite the policies that were set up, the human errors that allowed someone to come in there and still operate. There was a man who was a Chinese student uh, who was stealing uh, uh, just recently uh, information on a cancer research and they fired him. Uh, he went home and they never took him off the server and he went back in the server and he got information. Well, he should have been taken off the server immediately after that took place. So you say these kind of human failures that can uh, that break in on a repeated basis when you're trying to create an environment that is both open but realizing there are a lot of collectors out there. And as I said, this is a bigger problem from corporate America today uh, than it has historically, partly because the House passed the law on economic espionage. And that was an issue we, couldn't, we didn't have a way to deal with. When that law was passed in 96, we are dealing with it, and that is the growth area in espionage in the United States. Good. And I, I do note that uh, in your uh, written testimony, you mentioned that uh, of 555 individuals that have engaged in espionage-related activities since 1945, all but all of those cases, there was only one case involving the Department of Energy, one involving NASA, six cases involving university employees, but 252 cases involving the private, the private sector. So I think that's interesting. Um, I do, uh, I know that um, um, Ms. Van Cleve mentioned sort of the cost of this. Um, do you have a, any estimates of it? You said that uh, 12 billion was probably too low. Do you have any reliable estimates of how much this is costing us every year? 
it really is not possible to calculate how much this, in fact, is costing us because it depends on the assumptions that you build into that. The Bureau's estimate of $13 billion in 2012 was based on the cases um, that they had in, in economic espionage and what was involved in those particular losses plus their estimates of what they may have missed. Um, but my concern is, and I think theirs would be too, that there's a great deal of under-reporting in that, in that area and that the real cost to the economy is something far beyond that because what you're talking about is loss of the basic idea factory. R&D is the idea factory. And so what happens with the ideas that are lost, not first to market, not for, they're, they're lost competitively to right. others? Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time is up, but I, the only thing I might observe is that since so much of this is a economic in that we do have a trade deficit problem with the People's Republic of China and in addition to some of the other countries up there, that this actually could be one of the major factors since they're not paying for it, they're stealing it, or their companies are stealing it, or particular individuals are stealing it. And, uh, and that could be one of the major factors why we're not selling more to, to China. It may not just be a security issue. Uh, well, the gentleman's time is expired, and uh, uh, I think that's a good point, and that's re part of the reason for this uh, hearing. Now, uh, the chairman recognizes Mr. Posey from Florida for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank all four of you for your excellent presentations. Very, very interesting. Uh, you know, if, if Americans focused more on the many, many threats to their futures, uh, we would be, I think, a much more united country. You know, unfortunately, we're only united like we should be for a short period of time following 9-11, a short period of time following Boston, and, and completely another subject. But anyway. Uh, sometimes the best defense is an offense. And so, you know, any of you feel free to answer uh, whether or not we have an offensive program toward those who are threats to us. Sir, if I might take that one on, I think that's a superb question. Um, really, the, the, the efforts that we've made to try to protect our technology and science base have been largely def defensive in nature, which is to say we promulgate security regulations. We have export controls over the things that we permit to go out. We have classification protection around sensitive information, but what we don't have um, as much as we need to have is an offensive capability that can go inside the foreign intelligence service that is targeting us in order to be able to actively defeat their activities against us. One of the reasons we don't have that harkens back to my opening explanation today, which is we've never had really a unified counterintelligence strategic capability in the United States. We've done things defensively to protect certain um, operations abroad against foreign intelligence uh, attacks. We've enforced espionage laws here at home, but offensively to get inside that foreign intelligence service to understand how they operate, how they're tasked, what their liaison relationships are, the things that may make them vulnerable to us that's what we really need. So I think it's a great question. Well, I'm really sad about the answer. I mean, I thank you for the frank answer, but I'm sad about it. I mean, I was hoping you'd say, <clears throat> yeah, we have all kinds of those programs, but we can't talk about them. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to learn that we don't. I mean, there's, there's one reason uh, this country hasn't been overtly attacked, uh, and, and that's because people who might attack us realize the cost of retaliation, and it's unbearable to them. That doesn't seem to be the case in cyber warfare. In, it's, in, in cyber warfare, that's, that's, that's an interesting and, and challenging calculation in, in and of itself. And I think that there are lots of um, conversations, um, studies underway to try to better understand what we can do consistent with you know, our values and the laws of war in, in offensive cyber operations. So that, that's a great um, question in and of itself. But beyond that, there are all of the other operations of foreign intelligence services against us, where again, having a capability to get inside those services and, and to degrade what they are doing would be of great benefit to us. And, and doesn't it seem like to, it makes an awful lot of good sense to you to um, 
unilaterally disarm when you make agreements with these countries that are robbing you blind uh, in the left pocket and, and you're going to voluntarily disarm any defense you have in the right pocket? I mean, is, is there something wrong with that theory that, or something right about that theory that we don't see? I, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by unilaterally disarm, but I know I don't like it. Yeah, well, you know, supposedly friendly countries, you know, don't hack you, don't rob you. You know, they don't go into your Pentagon, they don't go into your banks, they don't, you know, they don't cause the, the havoc that they've caused. Mr. Major, you're waving your pencil there. Yeah, I did. Um, the Bureau in the, in the last few years has a very aggressive program to try to educate the private sector in economic espionage. Uh, they have they wrenched out significantly to try to uh, they even made bulletin boards to, to tell people about this particular problem. So, the, taking an offensive standpoint, they have. On the other side, the FBI can speak from them is has always had an aggressive program to target foreign intelligence services that operate in the United States to penetrate them to, to try to find out what they're doing. And one of the things you see reflected in the numbers I showed you, you don't just find an espionage case. Almost always when you find an espionage case that I showed you, it's because you have penetrated that service in some manner, either from a technical standpoint or a human standpoint. They've told you about uh, the fact that you've been under attack. The first target of the Chinese was made by the CIA in 1982. It was the first Western service to ever uh, penetrate the MSS. We didn't understand what China did for many, many years. One of the reflections we're seeing with the 100 cases is two things. You're seeing a more aggressive service, a better understanding of how they're operating, and I would suggest also a better penetration of some of these services that you can't talk about in this environment. because. The counterpart of no more espionage cases is more understanding of espionage cases, usually through operations being done by the intelligence community. And I know, at least in my experience, I spent most of my career running offensive operations against intelligence services that operated here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like sometime maybe we could have a closed hearing and have some of the uh, discussions about things we can't have in, in, in an open public hearing like this. Well, Mr. Posey, that might be a very good idea. <clears throat> See about looking into that. Uh, one quick question, Mr. Major: Are you suggesting more human and counterintelligence, more boots on the ground? Oh yes. I mean, the more you, you, you do this, the more aggressive you uh, operate. This is successful. One downside is happening right now, however, is that a lot of education programs are being canceled because when you have a sequestration problem, the first thing you cancel are training and travel, and that's what's happening across the board right now. Thank you, Mr. Major. Uh, Ms. Swallow, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Maffei, for holding this hearing. And Mr. Major, I think you make a great point. We're talking about uh, important threats that are facing our country right now uh, and the need uh, to protect and defend against them, especially against uh, outside actors and nation states who are uh, very uh, aggressive in uh, going after our intellectual property, uh, going after our government uh, networks. Uh, but on the other hand, we have the sequester, and uh, that, I can imagine, uh, you would agree, uh, makes it difficult. I mean, it's nice to hold a hearing and say, you know, these are the threats, uh, we need to, you know, be more secure, but there's no money uh, to pay for doing that, it's just, you know, we need to do that. Would you agree? One of the first things that's always cut is that. I've been around long enough to see this happening over and over again, and it is a trend, and it's happening right now. Also, I think we can agree that International collaboration has served our country well, and I, for one, want to emphasize uh, the role that scientists of Asian and Middle Eastern descent have played at our national laboratories. I have two national laboratories in my congressional district, Lawrence Livermore Labs uh, Laboratory and Sandia Laboratory, and also we know the role that immigrants have played in our country. Forty percent of the largest uh, companies in our country were founded by immigrants uh, or the children of immigrants. So I think it's important that we balance the need uh, to protect against espionage, uh, against uh, the uh, role in understanding that immigrants come here and they create jobs, uh, they participate uh, and engage in the type of innovation uh, we need. And so uh, that leads me to my question, uh, which is in Livermore we have what's called the Livermore Valley Open Campus. Uh, this is a collaboration between Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratory uh, working to create an open unclassified uh, research and development space. And the challenge right now, of course, is you have uh, laboratory workers who, uh, inside the laboratory, they have to be cleared uh, to work there. Uh, it's a 
largely inaccessible place uh, for the public and because of uh, shrinking budgets the laboratories are having a hard time continuing uh, to meet the the needs and demands uh, of their clients uh, principally the NNSA for Lawrence Livermore and so they're looking at uh, using outside uh, contractors uh, very often but getting those outside contractors screened uh, and cleared uh, is often uh, a challenge but we know the role that private industry can make and I've never been one to believe that the government should be uh, the only one at the table when it comes to innovation I think we have to partner with private industry so is there a way that we can continue to see these open campuses thrive uh, and work in an unclassified manner on perhaps high performance computing and cybersecurity uh, research and development uh, while still keeping us safe from espionage mr. major First of all, let me say that of the 565 people that we know are, have been indicted and arrested, the vast majority have been Americans, they're not immigrants. But we're all immigrants in one, in one length or another. But that's the vast majority committing espionage. However, we have both sides of Campbell taking place. What you do have in your environment is you have a mix and match. You have one person who's working in a totally open environment that which you're working on material, you don't care where it goes and who has access to it, that's one thing. But if what that same person is working on a sensitive program or a classified program and they start interfacing, it's very easy to, to lose the connectivity. Who am I speaking to right now? And that's, that's really an education problem. It's also an organizational problem. Do I want to have people that are working in these sensitive programs also interfacing these people in these totally open programs? Because very quickly, uh, the line will blur between the indivi that, that individual and who's my friend and who do I talk to and what can I say. So that's an organizational issue. Yes, yeah, sure, they can exist uh, separately, but it has to be done, I think, uh, in a calculated way. So you believe if the open campuses are able to uh, have that bright line that distinguishes between the classified work and the unclassified work, and, and knowing that in the unclassified areas, we can still make great strides and progress and uh, energy security and national security without giving the individuals working in those areas uh, anything that would be sensitive or compartmentalized. Do you think that is possible? You look at it and you say, I'm going to, if you color it gone and said soon after we do it, it's going to go someplace else, then it, you, ha you don't have a problem. But then you, the people that are working on it, they also have information that you don't want to have colored gone. And you've got to figure out, is that the same people or that different people? By the way, in your comment about economics, let me just wait on one other thing. We often say to corporations, however, that if they're going to go to China and you're going to open up a business in China, this is an economic issue, color it gone because it won't take long before whatever you have there will be copied by that society and you'll be out of business there. And uh, so corporations have to look very carefully because it's a big market, but they're not, it has a delta T, a period of time in which you can operate there before you'll now build your own competitor. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Swalwell. Uh, now, Ms. my good friend from Arizona, um, Ms. Schweiker, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, now, is it proper to say uh, Professor Vest? Chuck is fine. Well, uh, it's okay if you say so. Um, Professor Chuck, um, if, if this were the 1980s, if I remember the language we used back then, it was called the run fast theory, it's very similar to your bucket. If anyone goes back that long, the old, we were going to produce, um, particularly in military technology, this much faster than the Soviet Union. In today's world where everything is ultimately sitting out there on a server somewhere, can you ever run fast enough that um, our technological value, both um, whether it be military, whether it be economic, um, data research, is produced in a way where you can truly have, you know, something at MIT or other fine universities, a truly open platform? That, that's a, a really good question, and it seems to me that uh, when it comes to the distinction you made, I suspect that under today's contracting laws and everything else, uh, literally military technology could not run fast enough to stay ahead uh, if, if it were uh, uh, as, as you've said. I do think, however, that basic advances in information technology and life sciences and manufacturing and so forth uh, in new chip design, new materials, uh, bioinformatics and so forth, the, these things in fact do move fast enough that we ought to be able to uh, uh, claim them for a significant period of time, perhaps start 
initial manufacturing in the U.S., then it's probably going to drift off. Well, it, but if you don't try to stay out ahead of the curve, then you know you're dead. Well, uh, look, um, what, what is the United States' ultimate resource? It's our, it's our, our I'll make the argument, it's, it's our entrepreneurship. It's our free market. You know, it, it's that we do creative destruction really well, really fast. Um, Ms. Van Cleve, um, I've sat through a series of these hearings on sort of the banking finance side and learning, you know, the networks that are attacking bank accounts and collecting credit card numbers and these, and fascinating, and I, I not breaking any rules because a couple of those were inside the tank, that we literally have criminal organizations, criminal entrepreneurs that are not nation states. They're literally, they collect the data and it's up for sale for whoever pay for it. Are we now seeing that in the science and technology and military espionage world where um, I'm not a state actor, I'm in it for the money. And I'm going to collect the data and put it up, and whoever's willing to buy it. Congressman, I don't have specific insights into the kinds of entrepreneurial criminal organizations that might be going against our S&T base in that way. But I can tell you that I do know that there is a third country market, if you will, in, in things that get stolen by other well, that, that was going to be, well, in... So it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, the logic then, next logic step is, so it would not surprise me to learn that, um, that there could be entrepreneurs who are also taking advantage of that market to be out um, peddling their wares. Mr. Major, in that same um, thread, uh, I've heard lots of stories out there where, um, whether they be entrepreneurs, but also literally... Engineers, scientists saying, you, uh, if you can steal the equipment, we'll reverse it for you. We'll reverse engineer it. There are specific cases of that. Are the ones we've been tracking in Spypedia, we find that happening. Um, someone may be a foreign national, but they see the technology and say, hey, I can compete against this. I can take this out and set up my own competitive business or so, buy someone to do that. Uh, so, yes, we have empirical cases that fit you exactly. I'd like to add one thing to your fast run, run fast strategy that we had during the Reagan administration is that uh, that run fast didn't work very well because uh, we found out through a source called Farewell, man-made Vitrov, that the, as we developed new technology, immediately it was being stolen by the Russians. So they were not three generations behind us. They are about one or two generations because their espionage network was so large and so successful. It really, sh really shaped, reshaped our defense thinking as a result of that. And there's one source who told us that. But yes, there are examples like you're talking about. In, in, in this business, you have to look at this and say, whatever, the, whatever someone's stealing, you, know, you can't keep anything secret forever. You have to keep it, what I call a delta T. It's a period of time before it eventually become public. But you really have to define how long and how much you want to invest in that delta T. How long do you want to keep that, that secret for that period of time? And that's where you put your, your efforts and so forth. Thank you, Mr. Major. Well, being for all of us as members of Congress, we all know what it's like to be in an environment where there are no secrets. <laughs> that healed back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Swigert. Um, I want to thank the witnesses for y'all's valuable testimony, and I uh, want to thank members for y'all's great questions. Members of the committee may have additional questions for you guys, and uh, we will present those for you for you to respond in writing, and if you'll do those, please expeditiously. The record will remain open for two additional weeks for comments, uh, for written questions by members. Thank you all so much. Very informative, great testimony from all four of you. We really appreciate your effort. As I said in my opening statement, I don't have a prescription to balance between openness and security. And I believe very firmly if that property rights, whether it's real property or intellectual property, is absolutely critical for a free society. And um, if we have private entities or government entities that are stealing our property, whether it's military property, uh, real or intellectual, whether it's our research and development or what have you, that, uh, that we are not a free people anymore, and it's absolutely critical. So. If y'all have a prescription of how we can balance this and how we can go about making sure that um, 
that our national labs and our and our um, businesses and in any other entity here in this country uh, can remain secure but be as open as possible. I, I would welcome y'all suggestions for any kind of legislation that we can go forward. So please let us know. Thank y'all so much for coming today. Appreciate your valuable time. And again, I appreciate your patience. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing your written answers back. If you would, please do so as expeditiously as possible. The witness is excused, and this hearing is now adjourned.